Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at thechangeleader.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Dr. Danielle Wilkin, president of the University of Bridgeport. Dr. Wilkin recently became UB's 12th president, but that isn't why UB's been in the news. You may remember a podcast I did about a year ago with Mark Scheinberg, president and founder of Goodwin College, in which we discussed a consortium he was putting together to acquire UB's assets and programs. Well, as what happens in many acquisitions, there were some twists and turns in the road, and what ended up with was an even better solution, a new University of Bridgeport, which is standalone, that is owned by Goodwin, but is part of a consortium in the truest sense of the word. Dr. Wilkin joins us today to talk about the path to the new UB and how it's a great example of how higher ed is transforming for the better. Danielle, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, looking forward to this. We've had some great conversations and I'm sure this one is gonna continue to be in the same vein. I agree, I'm looking forward to this next conversation. You are the new president of the University of Bridgeport. And the reason we know about Bridgeport is from the previous podcast I did with Mark Scheinberg from Goodwin University. Mark was on the show about a year ago. I checked the date and it really was about a year ago and was in the process of just signed the agreement for Goodwin, Sacred Heart and Pear to acquire University of Bridgeport. Now, there's been a few changes that have happened in that last year, hasn't there? There sure has. So you're absolutely right. About a year ago, we stood on the property of University of Bridgeport. It was Mark, it was Joe from Pear, it was John Patillo from Sacred Heart, and it was Steve Healy from uh, University of Bridgeport. And we announced that all of those institutions were going into a partnership in which Goodwin and Sacred Heart would acquire the vast majority of the programs at University of Bridgeport. Pair would acquire some of the programs, especially those related to um, art and design. And at the end of about a year or so of transition, the University of Bridgeport would dissolve as an institution and it would really be the remaining three institutions that would have taken on those programs. And a lot has happened in a year, a lot of uh, conversation and discovery and things happened. And the plan was rewritten. The way that the uh, final product came out was fall of, of last year of 2020, Sacred Heart decided that this was not a good option for them. And they withdrew from the relationship. And at that time, Goodwin uh, decided that we would take on not only the original programs that we were slated to take, but all the remaining programs as well. And so essentially, Goodwin took on the bulk of University of Bridgeport with pair remaining with the programs that they had intended to start with. Today, University of Bridgeport remains. University of Bridgeport is still an independent, accredited institution and will continue to be so for a very, very long time. Well, I think that's that's a good thing because had it absorbed you would be the, the new president of a fictitious university. Yeah, so I would not be the president. I would still be a, a provost. But um, it was a really good thing for both Goodwin and for University of Bridgeport. From the Goodwin perspective, University of Bridgeport remained intact as an institution, and really all of those assets remained together. And it allows the institution to be a, a more robust, thriving institution rather than just peeling it apart. It serves the students and the alums in a much more robust way. Under the original model, there was real heartbreak, I think it's the best way to describe it, for the city of Bridgeport, for the students, for the alum. Bridgeport has been in existence for almost 100 years. They've served 
thousands and thousands of students, tens of thousands of students. And everybody who's ever been a student there is is really committed to the institution, is invested in the institution. And it really, they found, it broke their hearts that the idea that the University of Bridgeport was going to disappear. They appreciated what Goodwin was doing for the faculty, the staff, and the students, but they were devastated at the loss of their alma mater. The city of Bridgeport is, you know, so invested in University of Bridgeport and, and what University of Bridgeport represents for the city in terms of education and hope and a place for students to learn and thrive. So there was a lot of, of really robust conversation around what does it mean for the University of Bridgeport to remain as University of Bridgeport. And what we discovered was it was really important that it remains an institution. And um, we're thrilled to death that University of Bridgeport and the Purple Knights live on and are able to carry forth the mission of serving students today and moving forward. So was there one or two key reasons beyond, you know, the, the city of Bridgeport, the alums, all of that? Were there some particular business reasons that you decided to not absorb everything and UB is now, it continues to be its own standalone university? Sure. You know, UB and Goodwin, while they have similar missions, each one has its own distinctive brand, has its own distinctive student population. By keeping the two institutions separate and keeping UB as UB, you actually leverage the assets of both institutions really well. I often say, you know, you keep the UB purple and you keep the Goodwin green, and they are distinct, beautiful, bright colors that that you can see. And had you mix them together, they sort of become this nebulous color that you lose this distinctive brand, you lose their distinctive characteristics. And so while we are using back office things that are shared and we are able to gain efficiencies that way, or we're creating some joint programs where we're actually leveraging faculty on both institutions, particularly for our online programs where we both have the same program and we can leverage assets from both institutions to create an even better product. It really did make sense from a business perspective to retain the brands and leverage both brands rather than try to mold them into something and lose their competitive edge in each area. Well, that makes perfect sense because it is, at the end of the day, it is a business decision to do what you've done. That makes good sense. It's a new form, and we're seeing more and more of that, new alliances where students can go between one campus to the other. They go, in some institutions, it's online to -to face-to-face, hybrid models, things like that. But what you're doing is expanding that model out so that you're gaining efficiencies. It's not unlike what TCS education system does. Mm-hmm. You know, Michael, the, the president of TCS, was on the show a while back, and they run the back office and just allow the universities to do the teaching. Yep. You are taking that beyond that to where you're also you're sharing back office, but you're also sharing faculty. That is a very, very good model to, to emulate when it works. Yeah, and I I would actually encourage other listeners to consider that. One of the absolute brightest spots for this process for me has been watching the two faculty senates work together and take on projects together. The two faculty senates uh, have had significant conversation around the possibility of aligning a gen ed core so that students can easily transfer back and forth between both institutions. You know, they've taken that on as the faculty response, you know, faculty oversee curriculum. And and as part of this process, the two provosts were like, we don't have time to look at this today. And the faculty said, let us do it. We would love to be, you know, a part of that conversation. They um, have had conversations around merging their DEI initiatives, their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. So it's it's really been not only a senior administration working on creating opportunities and efficiencies, but really at the most organic levels, having the faculty and the staff have conversations and identify where there's an opportunity to support each other, to leverage each other, to leverage assets. Actually, our career services departments at both at all three of the institutions, Pear, Goodwin, and University of Bridgeport, all host an annual career fair in the spring. They all work together to host a joint career fair. With COVID, it worked out really well because it was online. Because they pulled all the assets and the relationships of all three institutions, they had a much broader employer base participate. They were able to dive into much deeper. Instead of just having a day, they had days for each individual field of study because they were able to 
geographically pull in more employers. They had more students participate. It really has been an opportunity for everybody at every level to uh, be a part of the conversation and to create the most robust experience for our students at all three schools. Well, this is incredible. This is great stuff. Now, it's not easy getting to the place where you have faculty senates talking to each other and saying, oh, we'll do that. It requires an incredible amount of communication, transparency, building trust. There's the whole process behind it. So how did you get from signing the agreement to where you are now? You're absolutely right. It took a lot of work and a lot of conversation. So at Goodwin, when I was still serving as provost, Mark and I would host town hall meetings for Goodwin every other week where we would provide updates, not only on the University of Bridgeport process, uh, but everything that was happening um, in the institution, including COVID and, and other things that were happening in the world. We had started that before we started the University of Bridgeport process. Once we started being in conversation with the University of Bridgeport and when it became apparent of the scope of, of the transaction, we started hosting town halls for University of Bridgeport faculty and staff as well. And so we would come into these meetings with specific agendas of things that we wanted to share with faculty and staff at both institutions. And we also would send out a pre-town hall survey to each institution, and we would allow faculty and staff to submit anonymous questions so that we could understand what their questions and concerns were, and we would actually build our agenda in part around that. And it was an interesting experience. We have faculty, because of the geographic location, we have faculty and staff who work full-time at one or the other institution and then work part-time or adjunct at the other institution. And they were weaving and bobbing in and out of both town hall meetings, and what was really wonderful was that those faculty and staff that that worked at both institutions were reporting back that we were very consistent in our messaging to both groups, that it didn't matter which group we were talking to, our messaging, our objectives, our stories were consistent. And that created incredible trust and it created incredible belief in what we were telling people that we were not, you know, we weren't telling University of Bridgeport one thing and then Goodwin another thing. We were being consistent. And so it was really fun on the occasions where those faculty members or or staff members would pop into the chat of a Zoom meeting and say, yep, they said the same thing last week at the other town hall. This is this is really where we're doing and what we're going. And and it was wonderful. There is a model for how to build trust. The good news for both institutions is we've worked really hard over the last you know, period of time to build good relationships with our faculty senate. So our faculty senate leadership at both institutions were in a good position to facilitate these faculty senate conversations, these curriculum conversations, and really provide some lift as we were slogging through some of the logistical nightmares <laughs> trying to do a transaction like this in such a a year sounds like it's a long time, but when you're trying to do this kind of work, it's not. No, it's 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 not at all institutions that I've worked with, if you can get the whole thing done in a year, you are just flying through everything. We were flying. You've got to have an incredible program or project manager to make sure all the pieces get done. Yes, yes, you do. And so there was a lot of work around that. And we we had a uh, transition team from both institutions where we were coordinating activities that met at least once a week, not to mention all those little sidebar conversations, but we had a leadership group that was meeting every week to make sure that everything was happening as smoothly and as quickly as we could. And to go back to your comment about communication, not only do you have to have open and transparent conversations on campus, you need to have really open and transparent conversations off campus with all of the regulatory bodies that are involved in this. There were over a dozen programmatic accreditors that we needed to work with on this project. We needed to work with the Office of Higher Education in the state of Connecticut, and we needed to work with NECHI, our regional accreditor, as well as the U.S. Department of Education. And um, I can't say enough for all of those, those groups. They were incredibly supportive, gave us lots of guidance, and were with us every step of the way, including being transparent about, you know, To your earlier comment, we signed an agreement in July of last year. We notified all the accreditors, this is what we're doing. It's Sacred Heart and it's Goodwin and it's Pear. UB will dissolve. And then we had to go back. We had to actually go back to each one of those groups and say, remember everything we told you? Remember all the documentation we submitted? We changed our minds. Uh, It's a totally different (laughs) arrangement now. And University of Bridgeport is going to remain open. 
And, you know, this yeah. is the relationship between Goodwin and University of Bridgeport. And so you had to be really open and willing to say, we thought we had a plan and we made discovery. And these are the things that we discovered. And we're being as open and transparent as we possibly can with you. And here's where we're now pivoting again. Can you please give us a little bit more time? Can you please give us a little bit more guidance? What is the best way for your particular agency for us to achieve these goals? And we continue to update them routinely about, okay, so we've accomplished this. Okay, so we've accomplished this. Oh, we discovered this. We didn't know this was going to be a challenge. And and we've been as open and as transparent as we can with those agencies. And and so there's a lot, a lot of communication. You could just have somebody full-time doing communication all day long with the various parties that need to be aware of all the steps that you're taking and, and, and why you're doing them. Oh, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. It's just, it, my mind goes back to WASC standard one CFR number eight, open and transparent communications with your accreditor. Yeah. And you have to have those, but those conversations have to be ubiquitous across yes. all channels, not only your accreditors, but your alums. Yes. Your, your, all of your stakeholder groups have to be hearing the same message, and that's how you build the trust. Yes. And we, I should have mentioned this. We did actually have conversations with the students as well. We did hold town halls for the students at University of Bridgeport in particular because it was the institution that had some challenges and some flux happening. And we did the same thing with those students as we sent out the survey in advance and we took questions in advance so that we made sure the agenda that we built for those meetings met the needs and the questions and the concerns for the student meetings. We had a graduate and an undergraduate. You know, originally we had one where everybody participated, then we broke them out, graduate and undergraduate, because your graduate students tend to be older and have different concerns and questions. And the undergraduate meeting, there were questions about athletics and there was questions from the parents that, you know, so you, do you try to be as sensitive to each group And you have to have a really thick skin as you go through those conversations because there's a lot of stress in those moments. There's a lot of anxiety in those moments. And you have to just be really willing to listen, to be reflective, and to be honest and say, I would say, you know, one of the most important things is you don't give an answer that you don't know. And if you don't know the answer, you say, I don't know. I'm going to, you know, I don't know. And I, it's, it's a simple question and I'm going to get back to you on that. Or it's, I don't know, because, wow, we haven't even thought of that yet. We're, we're still in this phase. And, you know, that, that's not a today problem. That's a 60 day, a 90 day, a, you know, a six month. But thank you for that information. Thank you for that question. And, and we'll build that in as we're thinking, as we move forward. Mm-hmm. So, so lots of, lots of moving parts that need to be addressed as you take on this challenge. Just. Tremendous. And you're working with Nechi, and you've had yes. nothing but great things to say about them, which is really nice to hear. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of institutions out there who are as positive about their accreditor as you have been. So, you know, kudos to you and kudos to Nechi. You're working under a pilot program with them, are you not? We are. Um, so Nechi actually has a pilot program, which is that's exactly what it's called. It's a program that allows an institution to take on a project for up to four years, it's something that doesn't fit neatly into the accreditation standards. And and this project, with the oversight of Goodwin, the the fiscal responsibility oversight of Goodwin over University of Bridgeport, you know, you typically don't see a non-for-profit institution purchasing the assets of a non-for-profit institution and, and keeping that second institution open and separately accredited. So they encouraged us to apply under the pilot program, which allows us to have this wiggle room as we try to you know, thread the needle and, and show where that balance is, that, that University of Bridgeport is capable of, of functioning as a separately accredited institution and maintaining all of the standards of accreditation while having this relationship with Goodwin. And you know, we have routine conversations with, with Nechi. They've been incredible partners to us. You know, as you said, I can't say enough great things. I also have to, you know, say the Connecticut Office of Higher Education, there's not a, a real pathway to do something like this. This is this was new and different. Our colleagues there were with us every step of the way. They, you know, really again asked us questions, gave us advice. Um, moved things along and supported us in every way that they could, as did the U.S. Department of Education. You know, we came with lots of questions. This is not a typical transaction. And people really did move mountains and, and spend the time to have rich conversations with us so that we could do all of the things that we needed to do to support the students uh, as we move through this process and to make sure 
that we never put, you know, accreditation or or any of those other pieces at risk. They really were partners. And I know so many times that we look at our regulators and our accreditors as a barrier to to our jobs that, you know, they're they're creating paperwork, they're creating process. There's nothing fun in, in what I'm describing. Really? <laughs> Shocking, I know. Um, but they really, they were they were excellent partners for us to help us achieve this goal. And we're incredibly grateful for the support that they gave us. Well, that's great. And I, I understand that you, you've you made Netchi its own parking spot outside the administration building. <laughs> um, they're certainly on speed dial, that's for sure. You know, with COVID, th- there wasn't a lot of in-person, uh, but they certainly were on our speed dial. It, it's good that they have been such a good partner, as has so many other folks with you. Yes. You're coming up to the end of what you call old UB. You yes. Know, University of Bridgeport ceases to exist in its own way as of June 30. And then on July 1st, you have what you call new UB. Yep. There's a lot of things that had to go into changing that between, you know, a new board, you know, new contracts, new policies. What are some of the things that have shifted? I would say the biggest thing that shifted is all of the employees who are coming over had to apply for their positions. And so we really looked at how do we, it was not an automatic transfer. We we had people who applied and some people who decided not to apply for whatever reasons they had. And, and so it was really, you know, a very deliberate process of moving employees from one institution to the next. Um, to your point, we have a new board. The original board did an incredible job. They did something really courageous. They said, this is an institution that, you know, under its current model is not sustainable, is not going to be able to continue on the path that it's on. And how do we create a new opportunity for University of Bridgeport? They didn't wait until they were in complete crisis, which is often what happens with institutions. And then it's a spiral to try to just find a place to to move students they were really thoughtful and reached out to see who might be available to help. So we have a, a couple of, of trustees who've moved over from the old board to the new board, but, but the new board, a much more diverse board, it is more reflective of the community of Bridgeport, the city of Bridgeport. It's much more reflective of who attends University of Bridgeport. There's more women on the new board. So it's a, just a much more diverse board. And it's a board that also reflects the professions and the the UB community in terms of their experiences. And so we're really excited about that. They're a very engaged board. They have lots of questions and they are certainly asking all the right questions and really want to be engaged and involved and a part of the UB future. So we're really fortunate to have the, the individuals on the board that we do. The big things that that will shock many people probably is University of Bridgeport had tenure. Under the new system, there is no tenure. And the other thing is faculty will be teaching year-round. So as we looked at our business model, those are two significant changes we brought to this new process. So when the faculty member is teaching year-round, you're under a quarter system, semester, what? Three semesters a year. So trimesters. Okay. And so... Will faculty teach for two trimesters and have the third one off, or will it be you know, three trimesters? How do they take vacation? So there's built-in vacation uh, between the, the semester breaks, and they will be teaching year-round. They can certainly request release time to work on projects or to work on research or those sort of things, uh, curriculum. We're bringing the model that we've used at Goodwin to University of Bridgeport. Okay. Well, that makes sense. New contracts, new policies. You've had to stand those up pretty much from scratch, have you not? Um, you know, given the fiduciary relationship with Goodwin, we've borrowed a number of the business practices uh, that Goodwin has had and and has been very successful in using, and we're moving that to University of Bridgeport. But we're also, for example, we have faculty from both institutions reviewing the faculty handbook together. So we have a joint, again, the Faculty Senate, got to love them. They are the best. The Faculty Senate presidents from both institutions have been working on that process with a group of faculty. And so they are going through the handbook, updating it for, looking at it for updates for both institutions. So, and, you know, University of Bridgeport also has policies and procedures that will remain intact that have been effective and are working as well. So 
it's really an opportunity for both institutions to take a moment to pause and to say, what is the best practice between both institutions and to learn from each other? So there's real opportunity for Goodwin to learn from University of Bridgeport, and there's real opportunity for Bridgeport to learn from Goodwin. And people are have, at both institutions have been really open to how do we create those opportunities. And going back to the conversation around joint degrees, that's a perfect example of, of how faculty have approached that. Our master's in education is uh, rooted in universal design for learning. It's rooted in an institute that we he- have here at Goodwin. It has a distinctive brand. And so we've we're moving both institutions towards that particular curriculum. On the other hand, University of Bridgeport has had a larger master's in public health program and Goodwin is shifting more towards their curriculum. So it's it really is this, it's, it's not a relationship where one institution says, I've been here longer and I'm bigger and I can, you know, we should do this. Or the other one says, well, you know, we, we had the fiduciary background to do that. It's really about what is the best practice at either institution and, and leveraging that. Mm -hmm. And the one thing we haven't talked about is the show of support you've had from your alums. The alums are absolutely delighted and thrilled that University of Bridgeport remains University of Bridgeport. Um, They have reached out by email. They've reached out by LinkedIn. They've reached out to our advancement office. Name a channel of communication, and we've heard from our alums. They are incredibly grateful that University of Bridgeport remains a separately accredited open institution, and they're thrilled that their namesake continues, and they want to know how they can be a part of that future. Well, it, it's neat to hear that you've had such great response from them, because we all look back at our, our alma mater for our undergraduate, and there's a special place in our heart for that. And for something like that to go away, it takes a piece of us away. So, you know, kudos on you all for for being able to do what you've done. We're very much looking forward to celebrating with our alums later in the fall as we, you know, have all of our homecoming events and and inviting them back to campus and seeing everything that's the same that they loved uh, with a new energy at UB. Well, you're closing in just, what, four days? Yes. Five days? Something like that? It's not a Cinderella moment. Uh, no. That's when the work starts, doesn't it? But yeah, the work has been underway for a while. You know, that's a conversation that we've had in the town halls is that July 1 is not a magical date. Uh, you know, the challenges of COVID, the challenges of University of Bridgeport, the challenges of the world don't magically go away on July 1st. But you can feel a new energy on campus. You can feel the hope. You can feel uh, the excitement. We're hosting our first town hall meeting after the campus reopening in July, and uh, people are really excited about the opportunity to be back on campus and to come together as a community and to forge this future together. Well, it's going to be a neat event. So we are coming to the end of our time. It's always a pleasure, you know, having the opportunity to speak with you, Danielle. What are three takeaways that you would give to your fellow presidents and university boards on doing a transaction like this or building a university that turning it around from something that was not doing particularly well? I would say start off with always start with your students. Start with a student-centered approach. That was the conversation we had with our accreditors. That's the conversations we had with our boards. That's the conversation we've had with the faculty and staff. When you start with what's in the best interest of the students, when that is your North Star, it's it's a good path moving forward and you will make good decisions based on that. So I would say, you know, always start with your students. Be willing to think outside of the box. Um, it's an opportunity to, to start afresh and to be able to say we're going to do things differently. You know, so many times in academia we say, well, that's the way we've always done things. And this is a real opportunity to say, that's the way we've always done things, but it wasn't effective. It wasn't, it wasn't student-centered. It wasn't, it wasn't efficient. It wasn't effective. And to challenge yourself and your faculty and staff to think about it differently. And so, so have those conversations and really be open to listening as you have those conversations. Don't assume you have all the answers. And on that note, be as transparent as you can be and be honest and don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know, and I, I can't solve that problem today. I, I had to say that a lot in the last year. I don't know, 
And I, that's not a problem that we can fix today. That's something we have to talk about, you know, at a later date. And it, it, it was really important because it allowed us to keep, it allowed us to keep the commitments that we were able to make without making commitments and then having to say, we can't do that. And, you know, share things in real time as, as we had to change things. We had to say, you know, we told you the X, but now it's Y. And here's the reasons why. Here are all the things we discovered. Here are the things that changed. And just be really open and transparent about that. It, it, will, it will empower you in ways that other things can't. So, so true. What's next, Danielle? What's next for you, UB? Um, the thing that I'm most proud of, of my work at Goodwin, is the work that we've done with our faculty in using UDL, Universal Design for Learning, as a pedagogical approach to support our students. We have a very diverse student population, both at Goodwin and at University of Bridgeport. Uh, UDL is a pedagogical approach that considers the barriers to learning and looks to create an environment and curriculum that removes those barriers. It requires faculty to be very reflective practitioners and allows the students to be a partner in their learning. It's work that I'm incredibly proud of, of my faculty and staff at Goodwin. And the University of Bridgeport faculty are aware that Goodwin has this pedagogical approach. They're aware of how Goodwin leads the national platform in this conversation. And they have asked to bring that to University of Bridgeport. And I can't think of anything I'd be more proud and passionate to do. I'm really excited about supporting the faculty and the students in that way. And I think it'll be a big piece of the culture conversation at University of Bridgeport moving forward. And so I'm really excited about that. Well, we're excited for you. You have an incredible opportunity. You're, you're, it's almost like the Phoenix. You're bringing something back from the dead. And I have no doubt it's going to be a great story. We're going to have to check back with you in six, nine months to uh, listeners I know are going to want to hear how things are going, where your particular challenges have been, and where your biggest successes have been. So let's plan on that. I would love to have that conversation. You can already start to see the successes happening at University of Bridgeport, and uh, I would love to be able to share that with you in a couple of months. We will certainly do that. Danielle, thank you so much for being on the program. It's been a great conversation, and I look forward to checking in with you in the near future. Joan, thank you so much for having me, and I'd love to check in soon. Thanks for listening this week, and a special thank you to this week's special guest, Dr. Danielle Wilkin, president of the University of Bridgeport, and for her sharing with us details behind Goodwin's acquisition, which is a great example of how to make acquisitions work even better through transparency and communications. Our next guest is Tony Huffman, president of Perdia Education. You may know Per Diem through their being a sponsor of this podcast, but Tony's an amazing entrepreneur who knows higher ed tech and is developing a new enrollment tool that has dramatically improved higher ed enrollment. He'll be joining us to talk about this tool called Emma and to talk about the state of the ed tech industry. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. And we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, Post-production by David L. White.